started reading this, and I want to just read a couple of things to you that you provided to, um, you know, your readers. Is There's an overexposure to video games in which the object is to solve conflicts or gain power by using force. Um, I'll read something else. The average child watches 22,000 hours of television by age 18, compared to only 11,000 hours spent in the classroom, according to Nielsen data. And I'll read something for on page three, which says children and teenagers in the United States are 17 times more likely to die from a gun than are their peers in the top 25 other high-income countries combined. Jan, yeah. thank you for writing this book. Tell us why did you write this book? That's an interesting question. I've been involved in the field of violence by and against children for probably 30 years. And when I go and speak and when I do workshops, the most often comment, often heard comment I get is, just tell me what to do. So I did. It's, It's not rocket science. In this book, there are over 400 things that people can do that cost nothing. And the problem, the bad news, of course, is that the problem is enormous. But the good news is that it's so big that everyone has an opportunity to help find a solution. And every one of us can make a huge difference. If we don't do something now, it's moving forward so quickly that we, we're left behind. If we want to see our children grow up in this culture of violence that we have created for them, they haven't created, they only think they're in charge. <laughs> and, you know, I've had three of my own and I have grandchildren, so <laughs> I know. <laughs> and there, you know, we have a tendency to blame the victim, but it's not their fault. We created this culture of violence. So if we want them to grow up in this culture of violence and then perpetuate it into the next several generations, we should do nothing. If we want to stop it in its tracks, we can do that. And you can see in the book there are hundreds and hundreds of things to do, yes. depending on where your child is, what you're interested in. Nobody has to do everything, but everybody has to do something. Jan, I, I'm, I'm going to, I can only speak for myself and my wife and, and, and our kids, and we try to keep them involved and engaged in extracurricular activities, whether it's mm-hmm. with the school, with the church, with, uh, a, you know, with a, a third-party function, or, you know, somewhere in the community. And I'm not saying that's the recipe for success. I'm not going to say mm-hmm. that, but that's what my parents did for me when I was that age. And 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 I, I'm just thinking it's just you have to, just what you said before, you have to be involved. Yeah, you know, we have to be actual participants in our children's lives because we are their first and best teachers. We can't be on the periphery. We have to be involved. And I'll bet you have open channels of communication with your kids too. Yes, yes, and that, that's key. It's, it's, there's, there's certain times when we're sitting at the dinner table, and, and you know, I, I hate to sound like we're the Partridge family or, or like the Brady Bunch <laughs> or something, but I'm like, we're, we, we need to have a, an open and honest conversation. And, mm-hmm. I mean, my my daughter is 13, my son's going to be 8, and I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be the, able to have that relationship, that open yeah. and honest with, with, you know, because I know at some point there's a switch, and that switch yep. happens, and the next thing you know, you're like, uh-oh, and then I've, I've lost them for a few years. Mm-hmm. I, have a, I have a theory about that, which is okay. um, when, when the kids enter puberty, Aliens come and take your children away, <laughs> and they leave these alien kids in their place. And the, then the trick is, if you don't kill the alien, <laughs> then you get your own children back <laughs> at about age nineteen or twenty. 
that, that's what I was wondering. I, I want to thank you for that because I was going to say, when do they come back? When do they, they say, come okay, back, Dad, you know what? <laughs> they say, you know what, Dad? You made sense. You really, I yeah. understood what you, what you were saying. You know, you were pounding yeah. my, you know, this knowledge into my head, and, and, and I was resisting it, but now I'm ready to take it all in. Well, I have to tell you, I mean, I'm hearing that now from my kids. They're in their 30s, and my oldest <laughs> one is 35. Um, <clears throat> he dropped out of high school after two years and did drugs for okay. two years. And okay. then decided to go back to school, get a GED, aced it, got picked up on scholarship in college. He's now a um, trauma surgeon in New York. Oh, beautiful. So beautiful. The, po- the point that I'm making here is that we have no throwaway children. Right. They are all worth investing in. And Jan, nobody said it was going to be easy. Jan, I know I'm getting a little off topic, but what I, I, I'm, I feel compelled to share with you. Um, mm-hmm. My dad wanted to go. He wanted to go to Foxwoods. And that's uh, the casino in Connecticut. And it was one of those times where I said, okay, we'll go. Let's, let's go on a Saturday. And my dad is 83. But so this was, this was some time ago. Let's say this is a few years ago. I, I'll give it like maybe 10 years ago. Um, and I'm 44. And I said to Dad, as we were driving, and I said, Dad, I just want to let you know something. I was like, I hear you. All those things that you said to me, I never. I said I just don't know if I ever really thanked you, but now I get it because he, he would always say to me, "When you have kids, this stuff is going to make sense." <laughs> and I know that's some of the things you said to your kids. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I, and, and you know, you have no idea how good it feels to yes. hear that from your own children. There, there's another <laughs> point that I'd like to make, though, that okay, um, even if you don't have children, you're still raising them. Because yes. every economic decision we make in this country raises children. Every election, every, every person we elect to office is raising children. So even if you don't have children of your own, it's like the vaccination thing, you know. Don't just do it for your own children. Do it for the other kids who are going to come in contact yes. with yes. other children. It's, we have to be there for our kids. You know, when you said that you were involved in your kids' lives, I think that's extraordinary. One of the ways, one of the most important ways we can be involved in their lives is to be in their school system. You know, the schools yes. are ours. Yes. We pay for yes. them. And totally. My, my kids, I've been wearing the same perfume since I was in high school, so, you know, I'm a, in a little bit of a rut, but all of my kids' friends knew the smell. And when I would come into their school, three stories up, I think, some of the kids would say, oh, Chloe or Abe or Sam, your mom's here. (laughs) My (laughs) kids knew. The kids knew that I wanted to be involved in the school and in their lives. And they were proud. They were really happy that I was doing that. And the the studies have shown that the more you're involved in your children's lives, especially at school, the better they're going to do, not only in grade-wise, but for the rest of their lives. Mm. So tell me this much. Um, I, I mean, I know from from reviewing your book, The Intended Readership, but mm-hmm. I want to ask you this question. You've written eight books, and I would love to have you back for each and, to discuss each and every <laughs> book, but... I want to know, when did you realize you wanted to be a writer? That's funny. I didn't. Well, no, I can't say that. When I was tiny, I must have been three years old, I was at my grandmother's house in Washington, D.C., and all of my other cousins and my sibling were out playing, and I was upstairs in one of her rooms taking apart paper bags and stapling them together. And I couldn't write yet, but I knew my alphabet, so I was putting a letter on every page. (laughs) That's the (laughs) earliest that I recall doing anything with books and with writing them. But I I did not train as a writer. I trained as a photographer, and uh, all I ever wanted to be was a war photographer. And I've done some of that, but 
when I started writing, um, it just it doesn't stop. I can't think about things to express without putting them in book form, which is a terrible thing these days because people have stopped reading books. Right. That we have attention spans that used to be the, the oh. width and depth of a cocker spaniel, and now our attention spans are that of gnats. I know teachers who have to teach in sound bites in order to get their messages across. Jan, so, I, 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 <laughs> I, I just want to jump in and say, if it's not 140 characters, people don't read mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. So maybe my next book I should write on Twitter. <laughs> what a great idea. <laughs> That's a great idea, you know. Hey, and you, yeah. you thought of this idea while you were on Late Night Parents. That's even better. That's right. Oh, my That's right. I'm going to write it down. Next book, Twitter. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> that is so, great. What a, what a terrific statement. Oh my goodness! Hey, I want to know this. I want to know this much from someone who has an extensive writing background. Like, mm-hmm. what surprised you about you know? Let's just take any book. If we just said in the in the line of fire, what surprised you about the process of writing your book? Hmm. Surprised me. I think. Okay, I'll tell you. There, there's whenever I do a book, and I and I. I only do nonfiction. I can't write fiction because I can't sit still long enough. You know, you have to be able to sit still and think for long periods of time. And when the kids were little, I, you know, of course you can't do that. And and um, I never got into the habit of fiction. So all of my nonfiction books are research-based, which means that I have to spend at least a year researching the topics. Gotcha. And I think the way I look at it is that it's the cross between a treasure hunt and a jigsaw puzzle. The treasure hunt is finding all the pieces of research, and then the jigsaw puzzle is putting putting all of that together in a way that someone else can understand it. And sometimes, here's the surprise part, sometimes there are pieces in that puzzle that don't belong. It's like your kid brother threw the pieces in extra from another puzzle. And so you have to... You have to have the courage to take some of it out that really doesn't fit and put it in the parking lot for another book or another whatever. That was the surprise. Wow. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Totally. Oh, good. You know, I mean, I, I, I guess that that's part of the reason why it takes about a year or so to, to, to you know, get your thoughts down for it to totally not, not just make sense to you, but to to focus on your readers and to, to, to get your point across. Um, right. This one took two and a half so, years from start to finish. Okay. Wow. So, so it's a labor of love, really. I, it, it really is. It really is. I, I have to say this. I have to ask you this question. So based on experiences of abuse you had mentioned about with your son, what are, what are some signs that parents and or d- adults should be aware of in their children that would indicate possible abuse or that something else is amiss? Right. Okay. Let's take bullying because um, bullying is a huge issue, and it happens everywhere. If you think your kid yes. is going to a school where there's no bullying, you're wrong. Totally. Uh, it happens everywhere, all over the world. The Japanese, in fact, are the worst um, at it. But These are some symptoms of bullying and abuse, okay? Being frightened of walking to or from school, uh, changing Mm -hmm. the usual route to school, begging you to drive them to school or not even wanting to go to school, feeling ill in the mornings or um, those kinds of things. Begin to cut school or to hide. Doing poorly in schoolwork, so if you notice that your children's grades are dropping, That's one Mm -hmm. sign. Becoming withdrawn, starting to stammer, lacking confidence. I've seen a lot of girls in particular who start out as really confident and then they're being bullied or even cyberbullied 
bullied, and their confidence drops. Um, attempting suicide, of course. There are many kids who have attempted and who have completed suicide because of bullying, crying themselves to sleep, having nightmares, refusing to say what's wrong. And this is where that communication line with your child needs to be open and not just right. now, not just starting now, you know. Right. Um, um, refusing, if the child is little, to be washed in the tub or showered by you. This is a big one because if the child has been physically abused, there will be bruises. The child might not want anyone to see those. They might have unexplained cuts or scratches or bruises becoming aggressive or unreasonable, uh, hurting themselves, of course, by cutting or burning or developing eating disorders and feeling helpless and exhibiting low self-esteem. These are all symptoms of bullying and abuse, any one of which could be a signal. And, of course, G's and more are listed in the book. Jan, I, I just want to piggyback off of that and say, for my church, for the Youth Christian Congress, I did a cyberbullying seminar, and it was just youth from maybe seven, eight until about. I had a, I had a couple of eighteen year olds in there, mm-hmm. and I just I started off by saying, by a show of hands, and I want you to show me the device who has a, a working cell phone, and for the fact that I saw, I, I can't tell you how many seven, eight, and nine year olds with functioning cell phones. And I yeah. said, oh, my goodness. Yeah. And it was just, I, I was just so perplexed by it because we then went into definitions and we had the open conversation. And I said, you know, give me a definition of bullying. Give me a definition of cyberbullying. Is this mm-hmm. an example of it? And they were like, well, no. Well, have you ever said to, I said, have you ever said to someone or to your friend's online if this person was ugly or fat. And they were like, well, yeah, I said that. And I'm like, oh, my. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you know that and every 30 minutes in this country a teenager attempts suicide because of bullying or cyberbullying? Wow, wow. And almost 50 kids are bullied every five minutes in the United States. And if you're listeners would like a sample chapter on bullying, I'd be happy to email it to them. That, they just have to great. email me. Gotcha. So do you have my email gotcha. address? I do have your email address. I want to ask you one more question, and then I know sure. we've taken up a lot of your time. And, and I, oh, no, I'm thank delighted. Thank you for being so gracious. Um, my, I guess my next to last question was – what do you like to do when you're not writing? <laughs> oh, that's really, I love that question. <laughs> you know, I like to joke and say my favorite thing to do is lie down. And the second favorite thing to do is lie down and sleep. <laughs> but I really do like to curl up on the couch and read and knit. Gotcha. You know, very boring, boring things. I garden. This year I'm going to try to grow cotton because I want to be able really? to spin it and knit with it. Yeah. But I also, okay. you know, okay. I have my artwork, I have my photography, I have all of those things. There is very little time in my life for doing uh, what you might call nothing. Okay. I'm pretty busy most of the time, but I love what I do. And this is what I do. I mean, this isn't the sideline. It's like it's like a musician is an actual musician and doesn't have a day job, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they're actually playing all the time. Well, this is the kind of work that I do all the time. So it's either writing about it or or talking about it or doing workshops on it or um, being on the radio about it. Gotcha. Jan, my last question for you yeah. is, are you, I mean, so what's next for you? Are you working on your next book? Do you have a title for it? Or do you, do you have um, a subject matter? Yes. Yes, and this, okay. is, this is something I've been working on for more than 20 years before we had the Internet. So the Internet has made it a lot easier. It's called Voiceless Victims, and the Voiceless Victims refers to children who have been at risk in war and conflict situations. And this is a project. 
so it includes an exhibition of the artwork and poetry from the Spanish Civil War to the present of children all around the world who have been at risk in conflict and war, and a book and a film highlighting some of those children's lives and the resilience factors, what allowed them to actually grow up and into adulthood. So that's next. Wow. Jan, I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on just, just for a few minutes. Um, we definitely want to have you back because you are, like I said, a wealth of information. You are like, you know, a walking, talking encyclopedia and we oh, appreciate the, just, you. just the time you spent with us. So tell us through social media. Now I have every way to get in contact with you on social media and I will put this, make this available in a blog for all of our listeners or late night parents. But Great. If you give us, give us your Twitter and Facebook. You know, okay. give us, give us like um, if, if we wanted to get in contact with you, what would be the best way? The best way is email because I obsessively check my email. And it's J A R N as in Nancy O W at I G L O U dot com. And if anyone has any questions that they didn't get answered tonight, just email me. And of course I'd be happy to send that sample chapter out to anyone. Gotcha. Well, Jan, we want to give you a round of applause. Oh. Thank you great. so much. I want that. <laughs> I appreciate this, and thank you so much for no asking problem. me to be on the show. Hey, any given time, if you ever need a platform, you definitely give us a call, or you send me an email, or or through Ascot, and I will be sending out the um, this interview and along with the blog for you for for this oh, experience. We, we thank you so much. Thank you so Thanks much for coming so much. on. You're welcome. Bye bye. Good night. And that was Jan Arnone. She, um, Jan was as as advertised. Oh my goodness! So I got to send our, our our good friends at Ascot say thank you to them for 